Joining me on the platform are four individuals that represent various ministries of this congregation, their involvements in the medical community, their involvements in decision making in the business realm, the workplace, and I think that what you're going to find is that the congregation is being equipped by leadership from all various angles to be able to address this thing as effectively God honoring as possible. What I want to be able to do is to have you draw out for yourselves the insert that's found in our bulletins this morning. It's the result of one to two months of research condensed to a single page. And that summarizes what we are doing, what we're attempting to do, our purposes, our objectives, and uh, a broad-based strategy that's unfolding for us to be able to consider so that we as a congregation are proactive, not reactive. It's very important to me personally that the church is the cutting-edge agent in the world, and that we are the ones setting the pace. We're the ones thinking things through and explaining to the rest of humanity how to go about doing it. So you start with God. And the opening sentence is that our sovereign God is all wise and imparts wisdom to us as we seek him and as we seek him in prayer. What we have to understand is that the coronavirus is fluid. This is dynamic. It's not static. What is said in the second period might be said differently in the third period. That's how dynamic it is. This is not by addition, this is multiplication. It's exponential. And so what we're going to be doing is introducing four phases that the church leadership has adopted. I spent time yesterday morning going over this with the elder board, chairman of the deacon board. Four phases that we will be utilizing to pertaining to our worship services in general but also helping us to use an umbrella approach towards all ministries in particular, equipping all the ministry leaders, committee, chairs, and on and on to be able to think wisely and effectively for the glory of God. So I want to pause and uh, allow for each one behind me to introduce themselves, though frankly you know them, and for allow them to say something briefly with regard to their ministry responsibilities, position, maybe their involvement in the community pertaining to what we're addressing. And so let's take a moment to do that, if you would, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dean Becker, and I currently serve here at the church as the deacon board chairman. Uh, outside of work, I work in healthcare management um, for Ascension Medical Group. I'm Christy Alberg. I'm the Faith Community Nurse Coordinator. I work very closely with our FCN volunteer nurses and at any time, but especially now, um, we seek to educate, um, provide guidance, offer support um, and comfort at, at this time. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Nack. I am the Elder Chair. Um, so I'm here representing the Elder Board this morning and obviously we've been involved in the plan that we've come up with for um, going forward. Hi, I'm Jeff Lines, uh, family practice doc, uh, elder, and also involved with the FCN committee. Thank you so much. We'll be turning back to these individuals in just a moment because after I'm done sharing briefly, well then, if they have any recommendations, any counsel, words of wisdom that they'd like to impart to us collectively as well as individually, uh, we want to take that to heart. I've been in communication with pastors of churches over a thousand in terms of their thousand plus constituency, which ours is as well, attempting to be able to discern the best ways and strategies to stay proactive rather than reactive and to handle the matters that are at hand. There are four phases I want you to see that's found in your insert this morning. It's not to say that these are static either. By a certain point today, we could be, have shifted from one to two or to three different phases in the midst of what you see. But what you see is that our phase one approach going into this weekend was to encourage those who are at risk to stay home. Those that have underlying medical conditions, respiratory ailments, those in the latter part of their years, that sort of thing. 
But then phase two in leadership strategic planning is to encourage everyone to stay home, but then to give freedom for those who desire to gather for worship to do so, not wanting to restrict those. Phase three is to close this campus. Close the campus with the exception of technology and worship personnel, and then offer worship services via live stream to our home settings. Pastor Aaron Brown is the pastor of contemporary worship and technology. Gifted man, Sean Young, we can work together with these various individuals so that we can put together a team approach so that the live stream is highly impactful. This second service is being live streamed right now. You'll be able to see it live, and many are watching right now. And furthermore, the YouTube approach is allowing people then to be able to um, gain added perspective. Phase four. Phase four involves broadcasting from my office with pre-recorded worship and announcements. Perhaps Aaron has led a worship team at some point in the course of this week in the privacy of this auditorium. And then it gets recorded. But the live teaching would remain. It would just simply come from my office. Now, as I penned this, as I penned this, we were in phase one. I'm not saying that that's where we are at this, where we are at this point, you see. Uh, I keep my, my phone on, and the emails keep coming in. And this is fluid. It's dynamic. It's not static been researching individually, as others have as well, information from the Center for Disease Control, World Health Organization, Wisconsin Health Human Services, as well as a host of other venues that are providing added perspective and insight regarding this medical matter. You are extraordinarily gifted because this church has wide-ranging medical expertise in all of its services people who are experienced, involved, engaged, and thinking things through from a Christian worldview standpoint, the whole realm of how the medical relates to the personal. And so we are at a strategic point because we offer multiple time venues at 8, 9, 30, and 11, as well as the live stream YouTube gives us then the opportunity to connect with the audience in a way in which we're able to disperse people so that we are not dealing with what I will call uh, population densities, where it's more likely for somebody to carry this and to communicate on this virus from one individual to another. And there's value in multiple venues. So with that, you see in your insert that we've got perspectives provided. Note that we begin by saying we're praying, not panicking. Those that love Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they know who's sovereign. They know who's in control. And that's the one whom we worship, you see. We're treating this situation, as I've stated earlier, as dynamic, not static. We're going to be adjusting our strategies as needed, and communicating accordingly. We're not going to be wedded to one method. We will adjust our methods as we go to meet the needs of the people. We are offering online worship services. Great opportunity for your neighbor to be told how they can likewise tune in and gain biblical teachings from online presentations. This is a new and powerful way for the gospel to go forward. We're going to utilize technology for God's glory through this whole process. Again, I will lean on Aaron and his team, Sean, to be able to communicate uh, in this way. We'll equip others to show how to be able to present this material online. We're going to encourage those who are feeling sick, appear symptomatic, to remain at home. And I would challenge those who view themselves as less vulnerable to find ways to minister to those who are more vulnerable. Ask, how can I go grocery shopping for you? Get the grocery list. Come back. 
And then talk about Jesus if the opportunity presents, neighbor, extended family, and so on. We're honing and in developing our cleaning processes. We have ways of greeting one another and expressing our love without necessarily having to do so physically, such as shaking hands. We're going to continue to emphasize in this time period online giving. Do not want any of the ministries to be hampered. So often when Dow Street, when Wall Street goes south, and oftentimes there's a ripple effect and affects the churches and the ministries locally, regionally, globally. But we don't want to impact the ministries. We don't want to impact the staff. We don't want to impact the missionaries abroad. While the coronavirus might go forth, we want the gospel to go forth, you see. So we're going to encourage and enhance online giving. Christy has gone out of her way in prior weeks through the bulletin to be able to explain good hygiene strategies so that we're proactive, not reactive. We're going to be constantly evaluating our ministry activities. We're going to be monitoring the health needs of this community internally and externally so that we're making certain that the vulnerable are being properly cared for. And we're going to make necessary adjustments, even matters of the physical, such as our handling of communion, so that that's done in a way that ministers to one and all. So I'm going to ask the team behind me if they have any further recommendations, words of wisdom, counsel they'd like to provide before I wrap up. Well, I can start. Um, let me just give you some facts, perhaps. Uh, you wonder if uh, there's only two or three people in our county, why are we concerned? You might wonder if there's 3,000 in the country only, why be concerned? The problem is that it's a novel virus, there's no protection for it, it's likely going to hit 40 to 70 percent of us. But most of us are going to survive. There's going to be 15 or 20 percent who need help. And if the system gets overwhelmed by it coming in really fast, there will be our trouble. And so we're trying to be proactive, be um, fellow citizens, if you will, help our, our less able uh, partners in the community. Um, we predict that it, it's going to double every six days, so it's coming quickly. So we want to be uh, ahead of the game. My role is just uh, to help sift and interpret all the masses of medical information that, that's coming through, some of it good and some of it not so good. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Um, I guess I'd just like to say again, <clears throat> we have a plan in place that's flexible, and uh, we will follow that plan. Um, the key people in defining where we are in that plan are those of the leadership team that have medical expertise. So, so it's not going to be us non-medical people determining the phases. It's the medical people who will be figuring out the phases as we go. The other thing I want to say, as again, as Elder Chair, this is a time <clears throat> for us to be drawing close to God. And this is a time to be turning away from the things that hinder us from drawing close to God. And you know, there's going to be a lot of canceled things that's going to free up a lot of time. You can't say you're too busy. This is a time to draw close to God. Thank you. The FCN team wants to continue to be available for questions, for comfort, for guidance. And um, thinking about what Jeff said and um, the very fluid uh, situation that it is, I think that the focus might not be so much on reducing exposure as it is containing because the exposure is already here. So we want to work on containing the virus. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. I do want to announce that the toilet paper fundraiser to benefit FCN will be postponed. <laughs> <laughs> stay, stay vigilant and take precautions, but also don't lose your sense of humor. Okay, that'll be a tough act to follow. <laughs> <clears throat> I think I have two points. The first one has to do with communication. Going forward, pay attention to your emails and to our website. There will be information coming out, where we are, what phases we're in, how your ministry will function, meet, uh, how you'll organize things will all probably go towards an electronic medium. Uh, the second is 
some explanation on why are we doing all this? Why is the country so involved in canceling events? And it has to do with the percentage of people that are going to get seriously ill. If there are too many of them at one time, the healthcare system is not going to be able to handle it. Not trying to be an alarmist, just dealing with reality. And that's why there's so much emphasis on the isolation, the cancellation, and, and the spread apart so that the virus is slowed down, that the spread is slowed down. That's the whole goal right now, slow it down. For me, I just want to encourage you to bring the love. Uh, you can do that in a lot of different ways, but I would just say if you subscribe to the YouTube link so that you know where that's at, and you have loved ones in the church and you know they can't get here, then you're, you're sending that link to them, and you're making sure that they know how to get access to the, the church worship services. Uh, Gary's already shared, man, when you go shopping, when you go do your, your, your life, you notice your neighbor, do the extra thing. You know, Have a little time at the end of your shopping experience to look around and see who needs help. The mom who's got the baby who who just the idea of going back or bringing the cart back or whatever you can be a help or you can literally go to the store for your neighbor who's afraid to go out uh, also I've had several people say to me there's a lot of a stress that's going to be put on hourly workers whose jobs might be impacted by this and we're I'm going to be talking with uh, our deacons about if you would like to give to help folks in the church who have an hourly worker wage gap in their life because of the coronavirus then our deacon staff will try to be judicious in the way that we would handle any gifts that would be given for that reason we'll be communicating about that thank you John so I'll have you read the conclusion that's found here. But I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. And let's bring this before God. Individually, locally, nationally, globally. And at the appropriate moment, I'll close. Now, Father, grant us wisdom. Wisdom to the executive, legislative, judicial branches. Wisdom to the, the governors. Wisdom, Father, to mayors. Decisions that are being made across the nation. Fluid virus, a fluid nation where people travel from point A to point B, taking possibly the virus with them. So, Father, what we need to do is to be extraordinarily wise. We're praying that we are able to be proactive in approach, give wisdom to others, minister points of need, bring glory to your name. Thank you that the passage of scripture today pertains to what we are covering in this announcement. We're asking that we can glean from your word and apply truth to life in timely ways. All these things we commit to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. As we prepare prepare to give our offering, uh, here's what's going to happen. The ushers are going to come and they're going to walk down the aisles and kind of whew, hold out the uh, plate, but we're not going to pass the plates this morning. So if you can, if you can bring your gift to the end of the, uh, the aisle, that's great. If you can't, um, you can place it in the box uh, right here by the uh, that's attached to the sound booth on your way out uh, this morning. Uh, you can place your gift right there. All right. So let's uh, 
let's uh, prepare to give our, our tithes and our offerings uh, going to the Lord again in prayer. God, we trust you. God, and we need to pray now for protection, for peace. Lord, that, that you, we would use this opportunity to love our neighbor. And God, help us to to trust you, Lord, and to uh, continue to, to build one another up, Lord. And so we we pray for the Mudinis, God, and we we think of them, Lord. Protect them. Equip them, Lord, as <clears throat> Abraham trains other pastors, God. God, we think and we dwell on what you're doing around the globe this morning and today and this week. Your kingdom never stops and is even accelerated by peculiar things such as this. So we thank you, God. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs>
And thank you so much. I'd love for you now to take your Bibles. We're turning in our Bibles to Acts chapter 9, verse 32 through 35. Those that are viewing us through live stream, welcome as well now. And love for you likewise to take your Bible and turn there. As we're going to continue in our series in the book of Acts, and we're today in chapter 9, beginning in verse 32, and while we're going to cover down through verse 43 in these moments that Gig gives us, uh, we're going to read verse 32 down through verse 35. And here now what you find are these words. Now, as Peter went here and there, among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him. And mark this now. They turned to the Lord. So we're going to be looking at these verses and more. And we're going to be exploring how Peter was used by God to minister in what I will call heightened health concerns for the glory of God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. And so, Father, now what we're asking is you give us extraordinary wisdom this morning. It's not an accident, it's an appointment with these verses that they would deal with health-related matters. There are biblical principles now that unfold in front of our very eyes that need to be understood and applied to the situations and contexts we find us in, ourselves in. So, Father, these moments to come, we pray now that you would warm these hearts, that you would engage these minds, that you would shape these wills. So again, now, Father, we've come here to see Jesus, him only. And praying these things again now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm traveling these past days from Arizona to O'Hare Airport in Chicago and then onwards, upwards into Wisconsin, you could sense that the mood was shifting in the airports. People were gathered together at television monitors. They were paying careful attention to what was being stated in various settings. As the vice president and then the president were standing in front of people, and as they were standing in front of people, what they were doing is they were allowing for a group of medical specialists to stand just behind them and one by one to address the issues of the hour. Normally, in these airports, you'll notice that there is this heightened sense of busyness and there's a loudness to these settings. But what stood out to me was that there was a subdued spirit and there were large gatherings of people that were hovering around monitors, screens, trying to absorb everything that was being communicated regarding the coronavirus and what was unfolding not only regionally but nationally and frankly globally. And as I watched, I sensed that among the people in the various airports, there's what you and I might describe as heightened health concerns for themselves, for loved ones, where they became increasingly conscious of their surroundings, of who to touch, what to touch, how close to get to another individual, and so on and so forth which was fascinating because we're dealing with a passage this morning that I think addresses these issues and allows us to develop principles for living. Timeless truths for changing times. So what I want to do with you this morning is to look now at these verses. I want to apply them in a very relevant way to what we're facing 
not only in these services, but also to our, our growing online audience, and allow for God's Word to speak to where we're at this morning. And what I want to do is to draw three significant usages that I find in these verses, and the way in which God uses either setting circumstances, people, so on, to be able to be highly impactful as he develops his master plan for this world. And the first comes out of verse 32, down through verse 35, that in the midst here, in today, 2020, of heightened health concerns, I want to begin by noting how God uses what we'll describe as overlooked settings to advance his purposes. Now you begin in verse 32 with me, don't you? And in verse 32, Peter has had the opportunity to see how the gospel has been going forward. It's been going forward because of persecution. The greater the heat, the greater the expansion. And so the gospel is going out because of the severity of the situation. God will oftentimes use what I will call the severity of situations for the gospel to spread. But as that takes place simultaneously, we find that there is this brave man named Philip who has made his way out of the epicenter of what's happening, Jerusalem, towards the shoreline of Israel and then northward towards Caesarea, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, sometimes one-on-one -on -one with an Ethiopian eunuch and so forth, small settings as well. And now Peter is tracking the movements of Philip, and he is consolidating the efforts of Philip while offering further advancement of the gospel simultaneously. That's the background to the went here and there among them all. And he came down, you and I are told, also to the saints who live in Lydda. And you say, Gap, never been there? What's it like? Where is it? Well, Look what appears on the screen at this point. Now what you will see is that it's a 30-mile trek from Jerusalem to Lydda. Don't have modern transportation that time period. And so Peter is putting in the necessary effort to make absolutely certain the gospel is going forth. In the midst of challenging times, you and I have got to make certain that we are putting in the necessary effort for the gospel to go forth. Now, get your bearings. We are heading westward now, out of Jerusalem. You, you just got off your tour bus. You're walking the streets with me in Lydda. What do you see? Look what comes next. It looks so incredibly ordinary, which is a way to describe Lydda. Nothing truly stands out. It's not Jerusalem. It's an ordinary setting. But what we find when you and I are examining the scriptures is that God uses ordinary settings to produce extraordinary effects. You and I, in the midst of this coronavirus outbreak, which is growing not merely through addition but through multiplication, exponentially, we have the opportunity to look at what otherwise would be considered ordinary. Ordinary conversations in the workplace. Ordinary communications online, social media. Ordinary encounters in grocery stores and the likes. And ask ourselves now, is God giving me an extraordinary opportunity that otherwise would not have presented itself in order to be able to impact others for Jesus Christ? And this is what's happening. God places Peter in a rather ordinary setting, Lydda, and now something extraordinary is about to unfold. Back to the text. Look what comes next. Because in verse 33, he found a man by the name of Aeneas. I want you to see the height and health concern. Aeneas is bedridden for eight years, isn't he? Paralyzed. Immobile. 
Now, what God delights to do is to do something rather extraordinary out of that which is rather ordinary. You know the old adage, Murphy's Law, if something can go wrong, it will. I don't think that's Pat Murphy's Law, but it's certainly uh, a commonplace law. Well, it's the concept of entropy that's applied to the universe. Here's a thought out of World Magazine from Leah Hickman. As she's pondering an opening scene of Christopher Nolan's sci-fi thriller Interstellar, Matthew McConaughey's science-minded character reassures his daughter, Matthew, that she is not named after something bad. Quote, Murphy's Law doesn't mean something bad will happen, unquote, he says. But, quote, what it means is that what can happen will happen. And that just sounds fine to all of us. The article ends, interestingly enough, with these words. As Murphy's Law plays out around the globe, not everything that happened will be fine with everyone, but Christians know that entropy is not the end of the story. Since Christ reversed it, he rose from the dead. Now, Peter is face to face with what others might view as an unchangeable situation in an unremarkable setting. And you might find yourself in situations where you're looking at what seems to be an unchangeable situation in an unremarkable setting. But don't take anything for granted because out of the ordinary, the sovereign God can produce the extraordinary. In Peter's situation, now he assesses the situation, you're up to verse 34 aren't you? And as you make your way to verse 34, you find Peter saying to Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Notice where he began. He is so extraordinarily Christ conscious, this man who at one point had been timid prior to Christ's resurrection. But now with the boldness and having life experience, where in Acts chapter 3, verse 6, he had seen one who was a paralytic being raised to walk, that the God of the universe, who has the capacity to raise the second member of the Trinity from the dead, therefore in Peter's mind had the capacity to raise the paralytic to walk. In the very same vein now, emboldened with that added sense of faith and confidence, Peter looks at Aeneas. Jesus Christ heals you. Rise, the apostle said. He's going to give him some mundane task. Make your bed. Immediately. The physician, Luke tells us, he rose. What's the ripple effect? When Christians are allowing themselves to be placed in ordinary situations for the sovereign God to produce extraordinary effects, look at what the residents of Lydda and Sharon revealed. They saw him, they turned to the Lord. Now, you're riding with me in my Wrangler. Of course, when you're riding with me in my Wrangler and another Wrangler comes from the opposite way, you know what you do? You, you raise a couple fingers like that because it's the Wrangler wave, isn't it, you see? And they wave back. You don't, you don't, don't do this. It's just not cool. Just a couple of fingers will do, okay? Now, Unfortunately, and you know the type, they're right in front of you and me as we're, we're, we're heading down the road. There's this fellow in front of us, and he's, he's going as slow as molasses, and he keeps breaking and breaking and breaking, and I know it's getting to you. 
He's got his turn signal on, but it's been on for eternity, and you keep wondering, when is he going to turn? Well, finally, he breaks, pauses, and then turns, turns left. Good. He's gone. We pick up speed. There's a guy in front of us, and he has picked up speed, and he is moving. But as he's moving, all of a sudden, he hits the brakes and turns without even turning on his turn signal. Now, what does slow as molasses man and the guy who doesn't give you advance notice have in common? They both turned. One turned gradually. The other turned suddenly. Both turned. And the, all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him, the evidence of the extraordinary breaking into the ordinary, where the movable has impacted the immovable, and they turned. Epistrepho, the Greek word, a word which is used by the physician Luke in the book of Acts strategically for something dramatic that is occurring. There is a turning of the tide, so to speak, here. They are turning in their mindset, turning their wills, turning their sense of life direction. They're reorienting themselves in the direction that God would have them to go. They turn to the Lord. Now, some of the people that you're trafficking with, well, they are going to be going slow. And they're going to be hitting the brakes again and again and again with the gospel. Others are going to turn so dramatically that they didn't even turn on the signal. But the reality is there's going to be various types of turners. And you are being used by God for the sake of producing a turn. Even in the midst of the coronavirus culture where people now are going to say, now what do I do in light of what I'm experiencing, the fears that I'm addressing? And you give them the good news of Jesus like the Moravians did. They went to Greenland, unable to have any impact the first year upon that setting. But then an epidemic of smallpox seized the landscape. Writer tells us that multitudes were prostrated. Missionaries, medical missionaries in particular, but missionaries in general went about them ministering to their bodies and souls in Christ's name. And after that, way, the way was clear. And the people said, you have nursed us in our sickness. You've cared for us in distress. You've buried our dead. Now tell us about Jesus. Do you see the opportunity now that this cutting-edge church has multiple services online, highly staffed, and all services with wise, gifted medical personnel? In the midst of heightened health concerns, God uses overlooked settings to advance his purposes. Ask yourself now, what have I previously overlooked where God is giving me a new and fresh opportunity to impact for Jesus. You're on then. You're on to the second usage. Because beginning in verse 36, what I want to draw out for us now is that second of all, in the midst of heightened health concerns, God not only utilizes overlooked settings, but second of all, unexpected events to advance his purposes. Now, what that means then is that we're going to have to get our bearings again because Peter's not going to stay in Lydda. Going to make his way onward towards the coastline. The coastline Joppa. Disciple there named Tabitha. That's a Semitic name. Simultaneously, her name Dorcas, Greek name. And she's full of good works and acts of charity. So you're back on the tour bus with Peter, and we're making our way now from Lydda to Joppa. You know what's interesting? That is part of the larger setting of Tel Aviv, Joppa, where David Ben-Gurion Airport is. Flights continuously coming in. 
But you know what else is interesting about Joppa, also known as Jaffa? That was the point of departure for Jonah, who, when wanting to escape God and God's will, looked for a way to be able to run away from Nineveh and head westward via the waters of the Mediterranean. His will, not God's will. You ever try to substitute your will for God's will? And now, you make your way to Jaffa, and you're pondering all that God is doing there, and why is God positioning Peter there? But then ask yourself, and regarding my work situation, or regarding my neighborhood, regarding where I live at this time in my life, why have you positioned me here? Take a look at the next scene. It's a picture of the harbor. The harbor of Jotham. It would have been the place where, where Jonah would have been purchasing his ticket to leave, you see. I stood there. Beautiful situation. I walked up and down the streets. You're with me. We're thinking biblically, geographically, the way the sovereign God positions people in various settings, strategies begin to unfold. What's God doing? And of course, there's the novelty of it all while you're in Jaffa with me. Look at the next picture. This is a restaurant. You say, what's so significant about the restaurant here? You know, the restaurant is serviced by blind waiters and waitresses. In fact, you're serviced in the dark. But they want you to get a real sense of the atmosphere of it all. Blind waiters, blind waitresses taking your order. Everybody's in the dark. What's on the menu? My hunch is seafood. Back to the text. There's Peter. And in those days, this woman named Dorcas, Semitic name Tabitha, means gazelle. She became ill. And astoundingly, what we are told next, she died. Now, typically then, the Jewish women, sleeves rolled up, they would wash her, lay her in an upper room. Dorcas, Tabitha, wealthy lady, most likely a patron, an individual then that would be able to finance the needs of others. They didn't have social security. They didn't have the, the abilities to care for people then as we do today. Well, what are they going to do? They, they lay her in her upper room. But since Lydda was near Joppa, and understand now, geography matters, positioning matters, geography in your life matters. God has positioned you in a certain place at a certain time for impact. Hmm. Well, the disciples, they hear that Peter's there. What are they going to do? They send two men to him. There's a sense of urgency now. Please, come to us. They want him to come, and to come without delay. In the midst of the coronavirus outbreak, great wisdom requires us to utilize discernment. What is time-bound? What is timeless? What is timely? Adjust your methods. Be flexible with your methods. And where you sense an urgency, maybe it is simply due because somebody is overwhelmed with a sense of fear, the subjective side of things. You might be able to minister to mind, body, and soul by discerning whether the Holy Spirit is giving you that sense that the pulse is saying, go. This might not merely be an urgency of the emotions, but the emergency of the gospel. 
and urgency of emergency. Please come to us. Come to us without delay. Have you ever decided in life, once and for all, that the delays of life might be the designs of life, but furthermore, when somebody comes along and says, don't delay, that that might also be part of the design? Are you prepared to be flexible when it comes to the way in which the design of life unfolds for your life? Bana, you're examining the text. You're up to verse 39, aren't you? And so in verse 39, you and I are told, Peter rose, and he went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. And when he gets to the upper room, here are the widows. And this is extraordinarily typical of the Middle East, as I've observed. The widows stood beside him. There's higher levels of intense expression of sorrow. So they're weeping. And to give evidence of the impact that this woman, who's obviously a Proverbs 31 woman, has had upon their lives, they're showing, Peter, tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. Dorcas. Why not utilize the name Tabitha at this point? Because when you looked at the map, what you found was that, that Joppa is located next to the Mediterranean. It is a place where the Gentile population will be increasingly impacted. Luke utilizes now a Greek name. And as Luke utilizes a Greek name, he is basically saying to the overall global community, watch what comes next. Peter put them all outside. He's got a model. Check out what Jesus did with Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5, verses 34 through 43. Note the connectedness between what Jesus did and what happens in this story. Peter's following his master's strategy. Do you? And so now Peter, in this particular situation, put them all outside. And noticing here that something extraordinary is being presented to him fully aware that the tomb is empty, he knelt, prays, turns to the body, and because Peter is a true blue Jew, uses the Semitic, Tabitha. He said to the body, Tabitha. This is rich. Arise. The very same Greek word which was utilized by Luke in his ex story and accounts to describe the resurrection of Jesus Christ when the resurrection was being communicated to other people. Luke is a physician extraordinarily conscious of all things pertaining to the body. Very detail-oriented. She opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand, and raised her up, and then the saints and the widows and widows, he presented her alive. You know the story... Every year, thousands of people, they climb the mountain in the Italian Alps. They pass the Stations of the Cross. They stand at that outdoor crucifix. Those that have been in the Alps, you know what I'm talking about. When tourists, well, the tourists know it's a little trail that goes beyond the cross. The tourist fights through the rough thicket. To the surprise, you come across another shrine. A shrine that symbolizes the empty tomb. 
but it seems to be neglected. Brushes growing up around it. Seems as though almost everybody goes as far as the cross and then they stop. But the believer understands that you're going to have to go through the thicket. You've got to get to the empty tomb. You've got to get to the resurrected Savior. And in a culture such as ours that, that treats the medical and medical technology of this day and age as such, that we want glorified bodies in the here and now, prior to death, rather than waiting for that subsequent day, subsequent to death. We've got to bring a fresh reality of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ to the forefront and understand how first and second comings work together, how mind, body, and eventually, mind, soul, and eventually body are brought together as one in complete wholeness. He gave her his hand, raised her up, then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And if you would please draw a line from verse 35 on up to verse 42, where in 35 they turned to the Lord. And now in verse 42, many believed in the Lord. And what has happened is that the extraordinary God has moved into ordinary situations. Don't overlook those settings. Overlooks settings to advance his purposes. Unexpected events to advance his purposes. Because God uses these things. And now finally, I want you to notice thirdly with me, the unlikely people to advance his purposes. He stayed in Joppa. He stayed in Joppa for many days. He stayed in Joppa for many days. With whom? One Simon, a tanner, and you say, yeah, but what's the big deal? Well, you see, Jews typically social distanced themselves from tanners. Tanners dealt with dead bodies. Tanners dealt with the skin of, of the body of an animal. And tanners would take the skin and then work it so that people would have their leather per purses and shoes and on and on, you see. Uh, but here's Peter now. And what God has done is that God has taken this man, this true blue Jew, taken him through overlooked settings, given him the experience of unexpected events, and now the courage and the fortitude and the will to hang with an unlikely person to advance his purposes because it will be in Simon the Tanner's house where now, as we're going to see in subsequent weeks, God will reveal to Peter what was once unclean is clean as he hangs out with someone that the Jews considered to be unclean part of the advancement of the gospel beyond Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria into the uttermost parts. And you say, yeah, that took place at Simon the Tanner's? Yeah, as a matter of fact, look at what comes next. There's his house. And you and I, we have gotten off the bus. We've got our GPS. We're walking the streets. And I say, hey, check it out. There's Simon the Tanner's house. It's being set apart historically. At the same time, we are able to look at this contemporaneously and say, God is still at work, and he's taking the gospel of Jesus Christ into the uttermost parts of the world, even through coronavirus. So I'm on this plane from, uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, to O'Hare in Chicago, and then upwards, of course, to Wisconsin. I'm sitting next to a fellow sits down next to me, he's extraordinarily animated, highly expressive, and, and he says, where are you from? And I said, I'm Wisconsin. And, and I said, where are you from? And he said, Wheaton. Wheaton, Illinois. And he asked, um, you ever heard of it? And I said, uh, I went to school there, Wheaton, Illinois. And his buddy, who happens to be his cousin, sitting across the aisle, and he said, he went to that Christian school. 
As Buddy looks at me, and I'm looking at him because we had previously been talking about baseball. And his, his, his cousin evidently played baseball for Elmhurst, and I played baseball for Wheaton. And his, buddy looks, his cousin looks at me, and I look at him. We probably competed against one another. He glares at me, so I just do what it's Christian. I glared right back, you see. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we continue the conversation. He wants to know a little bit about my life. And he was drinking and drinking and drinking, and he was reaching that point of no return. But before he did, he looked at me and he asked, Why are you so calm? And then, before I could even say anything, he went, Ah, and he pointed upward. Unlikely people. Ordinary settings, a plane. But the opportunity, through large or small, to communicate some extraordinary things in days such as these. Do it. Let's stand together. So, Father, for our congregation, live stream for the congregation here in this second period. Lord, we're asking that you would speak to hearts. There are opportunities that are so readily overlooked. Help us to take another hard look. There's overlooked settings. There's unexpected events. There's unlikely people where God breaks in. You broke into that tomb. Vacant. Peter had to look long and hard and adjust his sense of reality that you are sovereign and you are in control. Bring peace to each mind and heart now. You are sovereign. You are in control. May we take all the opportunities available to us and get people to start pointing upward towards Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.